Hello and welcome to Movers and Shakers on JTV. Today, Racheli Frankel joins me from Israel. In 2014, three boys were kidnapped by Hamas terrorists on their way home from school. After 18 days of searching, with the whole country hoping to search and pray for the boys' safe return, they were found dead. Racheli was Naftali Frankel's mother, one of the boys. Can you talk me through the day that Naftali was kidnapped? It was the last day, day of high school and uh, we were in touch with him a couple of times. Eventually said he's coming home. We saw it about an hour later. We texted him back, back you know, great. We later learned that that was two minutes after it was all over. Um, we went to sleep early. He's a big responsible kid. He'll show up. About 3.30 3 at night we were woken up by policemen that were looking for Gilad because Gilad's parents uh, were up and they saw that his phone went dead and he didn't arrive and they started making phone calls and they found out that Naftali and Gilad left school together. It, it didn't take long to, to realize that we're in trouble. Um, about two hours later we already knew that the last location of his phone was in the Hebron area and that's the complete opposite direction of where he was headed. Um, so, so we realized and very quickly the intelligence uh, realized almost everything that's going on except uh, where they're being kept. Um, there was a lot of findings of preparations to keep them hostage and on the other hand we had knowledge of shots uh, in the car. So. Uh, Everybody was very honest with us, you know, the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, pe people that we got, we met then, they said, look, all the options are open. Either, you know, maybe they murdered the three of them, maybe they're keeping them alive somewhere, maybe they killed two and they're keeping one, maybe they're wounded, maybe the shots were just to scare them. We're working under the work assumption that we're looking for uh, live, pe live people. Frankly, I think if they wouldn't have been working that intensely, intensely and under that assumption, I don't know if we could have ever brought them home. It then became a national story, and not only the country, but all of the world jury came together to show their support. How did it feel to have such great support? It, it, it took a couple of days until we realized that this is not our own uh, personal story, and that people are involved in an unprecedented way. Um, what can I tell you? I wish everybody in their time of hardship, and you know, it doesn't have to be so dramatic, should have any percentage of the kind of, of support and, and huge hug that we received from family, neighbors, community, the citizens of the state of Israel, Jews all around the world. Um, in, in a world that's full of bad news, we're so many people are slaughtered regularly and nobody hardly winks. Three kids didn't come home from school and millions of people around the world were sleeping, were, were losing sleep over it. I, I feel it's almost miraculous. I, I think I'm only aware of some of the things that were going on, but you know, if it was signs on the lawns and, and magnets on the refrigerators and, and, and the names in every prayer book around the world, I spoke to people and literally, I, I mean, South America, North America, Kathmandu, uh, you know, there were delegations in our home from Argentina, from Rome. Jews just picked themselves up and asked themselves, what can we do? And some was practical stuff like organizing uh, their parliament members and, and congressmen and, and trying to, to create political pressure, uh, organizing rallies, uh, organizing the, the speech in, in the UN in Geneva. You know, the, th the, the next thing on our agenda was meeting with the Pope. It was organized by some Italian Jews. The boys were found uh, before that. Uh, and that was, you know, whoever could do something practical. And, and the rest of the world was, we felt, praying with us. And, and that had great meaning uh, to know that people with us, were with us. And, you know, I never know where these prayers go, but spiritually I feel that something happened. And you even addressed the United Nations. How was that? At some point, some uh, some high school kids that were in Geneva on a, some kind of MACUN uh, mission uh, had met with uh, Hillel Neuer, the, the head of UN Watch. It's an organization that is supposed to hold a mirror to the face of the UN and, and sh you know show them if they're doing their job protecting human rights. 
and the kids had asked Hillel, uh, why don't you invite the, the parents to speak? And Hillel said, oh, but we have only one day to, you know, for the assembly, and next time is only in September. And then in no time, I was on a plane to Geneva. Uh, Iris had never had a passport in her life, and within an hour, she had a passport, a new plan, and they joined, but Galim and Iris joined me. And we came there. The way it works is you have 120 seconds to speak, and then the microphone goes off. So you go in, you do your spiel, and you get out. Uh, I know there was talk about a hostile environment there, but really, to me, it was getting our story out and um, using the UN as a platform to gain legitimacy for our story because we, we saw our, our job as buying time for the government so they can continue the, the search. Um, because we were sure that pretty soon there'll be international pressure to stop the pressure on the, on the population in the Hebron area. And, and we were afraid that the search will stop before the, the boys would be found. Um, so for us it was just getting the story out there, speaking to journalists around in Geneva. We later met with the um, Red Cross, etc. Um, and you're considered a national heroine and public leader. How do you find such strength through such tragedy to teach? My life hasn't changed much. I, I, uh, professionally, my field is teaching Torah, uh, Talmud, Halakha, and that's what I continue doing. Uh, Iris and Bat Galim professionally are, are continuing uh, to do what they, what they were doing. Our, our husbands, the same. Uh, we were blessed with young children that, you know, when you feel like you want to go under the quilt and, and say, I'm coming out in six months, uh, you have a little child, three, four, five years old, climbing all over you and they need what they need, thank God. And it pulls you by, back into, into life. Personally, I feel that um, there's, there's pain in our life, but, but there's so much blessing. And I wouldn't want to, you know, to let the pain cover the blessing. It's about trying to live the full spectrum, give room for the, for the, for the pain, for the weeping, give room for the joy and the laughter. Um, I think looking at both, you know, at, at the three families, we're, we're dealing with something difficult, but, but thank God we're doing well. You established the Jerusalem Unity Prize. Can you explain to me what this is? You know, that, st that summer started with, with the search for our boys for 18 days and then there was the shiva, the mourning period. And immediately after that, the, in Israel, there was operat Operation Protective Edge. And that was a very difficult war that, you know, missiles were flying all over and there were a lot of casualties and still for, and that lasted for 51 days. And still for weeks and weeks and weeks, Something of the spirit of those days was, was you know, was continuing. Um, the ability to reach out for people, to identify somebody else's need, and and to be there for them. Uh, not only you know running to the soldiers and giving them out socks and tablets, but uh, really you know reaching the last elderly person that's alone in a in a in a shelter and and giving you know being with them all the wonderful people that are doing things um, with the intention to connect different part, parts of the Jewish people and to bring these distant relatives together. And the other is a project called Unity Day. And uh, already last year and more so this year, and this year it's going to be in the first, in June 1st, it's always going to be in the area of the Yeltsin of the boys of the day of the, of the murder. Every year it changes a little according to the needs of, uh, of the schools and communities. In last year, in dozens and dozens of communities around the world, people were doing things to, to promote and create unity on Unity Day. And in Israel, the Ministry of Education, the Army, the youth movements, uh, a lot of uh, civilian organizations all want to do something special on Unity Days where you, uh, where you can you know, look to the right, look to the left, see Jews that dress differently, have different dreams for the Jewish people, and, and say they're my brother and my sister, and, and I, you know, I care about them deeply. I, I, um, Rabbi Jonathan Zacks said, let me put it bluntly. I don't want you to agree with me, but I want you to care about me, and I want to, because I care about you. So basically, this is the concept. 
when you know I get to speak to many interesting people over this period of time and people were saying there was a miracle that happened to us in our community or in our city during that time first in rallies and in and in prayers and then in memorials we stood together Haredi, Hasidic Jewish, uh, ultra-Orthodox, modern Orthodox, conservative, reform, so-called non-affiliated Jews, and we all stand together. And the elders of the community couldn't recall this happening for decades. So, you know, we're just, <laughs> we're begging. If we can find some good excuses to do this again, uh, just to reach out and, and to feel the, the underlying knowledge of us being family.